Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Brittany Sierra, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Sustainable Fashion Forum. And I am incredibly excited for this conversation today, talking about the realities of textile recycling, where we're at, where we're going, and how we're going to get there. This is all in celebration of National Recycling Day, which is today. So shout out to Four Days for sponsoring this conversation. There's literally so much to talk about, and I have so many questions. So I am going to let these three amazing women introduce themselves, and then we can get started. So Caroline, you're actually the first box on my screen. So <laughs> would you like to, to go first? Um, Brittany, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a managing director at Closed Loop Partners. We are a hybrid investment firm and innovation center focused on development of circular economies. I lead a growth equity practice and invest across both venture capital and growth equity in solutions for a cleaner, more circular future. One of the key pillars of our investment thesis is fashion. So really excited to dig into the conversation today. And prior to investing, I spent 25 plus years on the operational side of the apparel industry. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> nice. Well, Stacy, it flipped over to you. So would you like to go? <laughs> Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm Stacy Flynn, CEO and co-founder of Evernew, and I am a textile and apparel specialist by training. Um, I've worked in this industry for a long time um, for some of the largest brands, retailers, and supply chain partners in the world. Um, and now I am focusing my energy on innovation to ideally leverage the power of the business model to create uh, a, a reduction of impact to our to our natural resources. So very happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. And Christy. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, what a great group you've brought together of friendly faces and 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 folks with kind of shared a shared view on the future. Um, I am the CEO and co-founder of Four Days. Uh, similar to these uh, two incredible women, I've been in the industry of I've been in the fashion industry for close to two decades, which is always crazy to say out loud, um, and really approach four days as this kind of catalyst for circular behavior. So very customer focused um, behavioral model to engage the consumer in circular habits. We do that through products, uh, take back programs. We connect into the larger ecosystem for sorting, grading, recycling. Um, but our aim really is to drive the industry towards circularity. So, you know, that idea of building a circular economy, like the true economy piece of it is what we focus on. Um, and then get to partner with incredible innovators and, and super smart people like Stacey and Evernew to, <laughs> to drive that forward. So, well, to kick off the conversation, I wanted to start by getting a lay of the land. According to the 2017 um, report by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the new textile economy, they reported that every second, you know, the equivalent of a garbage truck load of clothing is incinerated or landfilled. And I feel like that stat has been used all over the place. Um, and they also shared that 1% or less than 1% at the time of textile waste was recycled into new textiles, the majority of it being downcycled into items like um, mattress stuffing and insulation and industrial wipes, which eventually still end up going to the landfill. So I'm curious, where are we today? Um, it seems like just this week, there are so many different announcements in this space regarding recycling and what's happening. So I'm curious, where are we today? Um, and are we any closer to recycling more than that 1%? I, I think we're probably in the same place uh, if you look at it as a whole. Mm -hmm. But I think that's specifically because the volume is so massive. So it's not that innovation hasn't been happening, but we take a ton of product back. And so we get kind of a view on the full stack of used clothing. And the reality is the kind of match of capacity for fiber to fiber recycling and the quantity of clothes that we're collecting, there's a mismatch there. There's also a shortage of, I can go into all the problems. There's a shortage of collection. There's a shortage of, shortage of sorting. Like we'll get into it, I think in this conversation, but mm -hmm. my, my guess without um, the true data behind it, maybe somebody else has the stat is we're probably in the same place this many years later. However, I think what's happening behind the scenes is really forcing kind of a new ecosystem to develop. It's just taking, it's going to take time. It's inevitable. I agree that we're probably in a similar place today, but what we see is a lot of activity coming to the fore of solutions that are trying to meet the demand. And so 
you know, one of the big problems that we face is, is pure infrastructure. Are there facilities that have the technology to process materials? Is there technology that can enable clean sorting and understanding of the complexity of blends and some of the unique challenges we face within apparel? So the exciting thing is that as we look at solutions for the core of our work, we see a lot bubbling up, but there's still a lot that has to happen for corporations to meet the types of consumer facing commitments that they have made within the time frame that they specified. It's gonna be a lot of activity, get ready. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I would concur with both of those uh, statements. In 2011, when we ran our first uh, systems analysis on the problem, we uh, realized that consumers in the United States were disposing of about 11 million tons of textile waste a year. Um, as of 2017, that number went up to 17 million tons. So even if we've got recycling innovation coming online, the volume of waste is going up at a greater rate than the recycling technologies are currently deployed. But I agree with you. We are on the verge of a renaissance within this industry. And I think, you know, realistically, um, it takes about 20 years to get any meaningful production up and off the ground. So we're about 10 years in at this point and for at Evernew anyway. And we know realistically, we've got about 10 more years before we're at any meaningful volume. Casey, you mentioned uh, the textile waste that's coming from consumers. And I'm curious, because I know like we have a lot of different folks that are will be listening to this conversation that are all across the board as far as knowledge of the space. And so I'm curious, when we talk about textile waste, are we talking specifically of like what's coming from consumers when they're discarding their clothing or where is this waste coming from? It comes from a lot of different places. You know, we've got waste as a natural byproduct of a cut and sew operation because we generally knit and weave in rectangles and the body is not a rectangle. So you've got some natural waste uh, um, coming from a cut and sew operation that's considered pre-consumer waste. Um, then once that uh, those garments are made into apparel, um, then you've got garments that may be unsold. Um, so that's also uh, considered pre-consumer waste. It's processed. Uh, and then you've got post-consumer waste, the things that we all wear. And, uh, you know, it's got wearing contaminants on it. So within the spectrum of uh, pre-consumer to post-consumer, you've got different grades. And the way that it's graded is it's pre-consumer, post-consumer, and then it's light, medium, dark. So uh, pre-consumer white or undyed is the easiest to break down. Post-consumer black or super black is the hardest to break down. So it, it really does run the gamut in terms of uh, uh, what kind of feedstock are we talking? And then the technologies are all adopt, adapted to that those specific feedstocks. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the textiles that are being recycled right now, currently, is that pre-consumer or is that post-consumer? Is it a mix of both? Or like, what, is, what does that look like? Mix of both, for sure. I think, you know, when you, ever you industrialize an operation, we can break down post-consumer black and post-consumer super black in our labs. Um, but when you industrialize, generally use the easiest feedstock to start, and then you layer on complexity, starting with light, medium, and dark. Um, but yeah, and, and there are many ways to break down textiles. There's chemical and mechanical. So mechanical recycling isn't as sensitive to color as chemical recycling is. So there are many ways in which you can uh, break down textile waste. I think what Stacy is running through really brings to light the complexity of sortation. Yep. And you know, I think this is one of the big hurdles that we need to cross in terms of infrastructure and technology that can enable the right materials to get the to the right place to be reused. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So for the non-scientist brain, how are textiles turned into fibers? Like I know it's like this long, complex process, but just like real quick for <laughs> who just don't have that brain, which is me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try to be, I'll try to be real quick. I, I, um, I am a textile specialist, so I'll, I'll try to be brief and use, uh, not use a lot of jargon, but there are two ways you can break down textile waste, mechanical and chemical. 
Mechanical is essentially shredded. Uh, the fibers are then spun into new yarns. It's generally short staples, so it has to be mixed with some degree of virgin new fiber in order to meet the minimum standards for wearing apparel. Um, chemical recycling, you break down the waste to the polymer level, so the smallest common denominator, and then essentially you're turning it from a liquid back into a solid state uh, using an extruder. Um, and an extruder looks like essentially uh, um, it's uh, a, a piece of equipment that has a dial on the end. And when you're turning it from a liquid to a solid, you push it through a dial called a spinneret. The shape of the holes and the number of holes determine the characteristics of that fiber and fabric and garment. So you can engineer a lot of your performance attributes by the spinneret you use. So you have a lot of design capability when you uh, when we go to chemical recycling, and that's really how we're able to increase performance using mechanically or chemically recycled materials compared to mechanically recycled materials. Mm -hmm. I hope that. Uh, was uh, let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. One thing that I think is like really interesting when I when I think about um, recycling and textile recycling, aside from the environmental benefits um, and its ability to help us mitigate mitigate you know fashion's impact on climate change. It seems like brands are really excited about recycling because even though they want to champion sustainability, just from observing, it seems as though they don't want to produce less and they definitely don't want, you know, consumers to stop buying their products. And from a consumer standpoint, um, Christy, like you really introduced me to this was the <laughs> psychology of consumer behavior and the attitude behavioral gap between what consumers say that they're interested in versus like what they're actually doing. Um, and from both perspectives, it seems as though textile recycling really is maybe like an enabler, so to speak, um, where it allows brands to continue, or I guess both brands and consumers to continue this idea that clothing is disposable and that it can be disposable because now we can recycle it and it can be something else. And so you can just keep consuming, consuming, consuming. So I guess I'm just curious from your perspective, where does textile recycling sit in the circularity conversation? Um, is this, is it okay for us to use recycling as this, I guess, catalyst to being able to like keep consuming and producing or like, where does it sit? Oh, it's, that's a really amazing question and very, <laughs> very, very complicated. So <laughs> bear with me. Um, I think it starts with the fact, well, we've been digging into this. So, you know, I think as an early innovator in circular behavior, um, we found ourselves in a spot where we're trying to kind of demystify some of this. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that come out and they're like, we're recycling hundred percent of our product in the U S and I'm like, not possible, like just plain and simply not possible. And I can get into like what we, what we consume, what we discard, where that can go. I think, you know, at the highest level of circularity, you're trying to retain those precious materials in circulation somehow. Um, and then I think the word recycling gets co-opted in a very broad kind of application. So for example, if you go to like a sorter, grader, collector, reseller, they call that recycling. Um, and yet most people think of recycling and we think of like the cans going into like a recycling process and becoming a new can. The majority of the industry, that's why that 1% statistic exists, recycling by definition, the majority means resale. And so when people come and say, you know, we can recycle all of our clothes, us included, we've, we've used those terminologies and, and we're actually trying to really delineate what recycling, reuse, resale, downcycling, upcycling, fiber to fiber recycling, they're all different waste streams. So, and I think it, it then means like the reality is that we, we, we are trying to divert from landfill. Like that's a number one priority, divert from landfill. Where does it go next? Is it perfect? No, because the solutions that exist today are imperfect. And as we just said, we're pretty far away from having like the real infrastructure to make more perfect decisions, but we can make better decisions. And so I think that's just the kind of reality of, of the architecture of used clothing, the economies of used clothing is that resale, and we're not talking domestic resale on thread up, like international resale markets are actually a very vital piece of 
of kind of used clothing economies. It's often, you know, done horribly and criminally, and that's a problem, but there's the other half of it that's actually done responsibly and, and that drives economies. So it's a complicated term used in ways that can be confusing to customers. Um, so I think in one sense, yes, it could make people think, you know, hey, uh, I can buy this, I can wear it twice, I can recycle it. You know, and the same is true. Like I could resell it for 20 bucks. It's fine. Mm -hmm. So there is that. I think it's actually a validation of a behavior that already existed versus the driving source of it. And we don't have data on that yet. That's when I say like, we're, we're actually trying to kind of really dig into these very salient points with data to say, okay, is there any correlation with recycling availability and more consumption? I, I've yet to see anybody say that for real. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think we could say that because recycling is available, people are consuming more. I think people are consuming more and they're making themselves feel better. <laughs> but they were going to do that anyway. That would be my take on it, but we're looking into it. I don't, I don't have a data point that tells me otherwise. Um, we know that prior to recycling being kind of in the headlines, I mean, even five years ago, again, like I, I think I mentioned this as we were starting, it's like we were, I was in Caroline's office going, <laughs> this very beautiful corporate office. And I was like, so circularity, we have to recycle clothes. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? So we've come a long way in using this terminology more publicly in five years, but to think that we're at a perfect place five years later where we can do that to how people are interpreting it is just, it's, it's, a, it's just untrue. Um, so people who claim that aren't telling the truth, it's, it's misleading. Um, but I think getting into the nitty gritty of it, but yeah. So to answer your question, I don't have a data point on whether advertising recycling is driving consumption. I would guess no, because we were still having this problem five years ago before we advertised recycling, but remains to be seen. We're digging in. And yeah, we're working. Sorry, Caroline, go ahead. That was a lot. Go ahead. <laughs> you go. We have so much okay. to say about this. Yes. Like, this is a big topic. I was like, that's a big yeah, topic. It is a big to unpack topic. It. <laughs> yes. And we are working with a uh, very large brand retail clients and, you know, they do have a dominant business model with style obsolescence being the key driver. And, you know, this is the, the fast fashion model is definitely under review. Uh, I think when you talk about changing a business model, you're pushing a boulder uphill. If you go into a multi-billion dollar company and say, and and almost shame them for being wrong because that's not the way to get any real progress uh, uh, completed. So we do have to start where people are in terms of their journey, especially these folks who have a business, they've got to protect the business. So one of the things that we've been looking at is like, where do we need to deploy technology specifically and can we leverage the power of the existing model to create wide sweeping systemic benefit? And if we're able to actually pull that off, we can use the power of this model as a massive catalyst for, for change. And that's, I think, what we're trying to do and what the majority of the mass brands and retailers that we work with are trying to figure out how to do it's not necessarily that they're advocating for more consumption. They absolutely want to keep their businesses intact, but how they keep their businesses intact, I think it's all under review right now. And I do see in the future that we are going to have a more equitable distri distribution of value across all of the players in this equation, which is really exciting, but it's going to take some time. Yeah, what I what I wanted to say, I'm I'm gonna brag a little bit for Stacy here. Um, this is why technologies like what she has been creating at Evernew are so critically important for the future and so powerful to how we're gonna solve for this problem because mechanical recycling today does have limitations in terms of being able to deal with complex materials. Also, it's really important not to just consider what's happening at the end of life of a product and how it gets recycled but what is happening way upstream in that process? Because a lot of the decisions that are made, be it material use, be it process, will predicate its ability to be reused or recycled. And I think the metric on that is 80 to 90% of the outcome of a product's end of life solution is decided in the design room. 
right? Yes. So it's also making smart choices early on and, and educating design teams and companies on, you know, what they can be doing to create a garment that is able to be processed, taken apart, or, you know, thanks to businesses like Evernew, we'll be able to be, you know, advanced recycling and, and molecular recycling in the future. Um, so those are really important technologies. There's no designer on earth that wants their work to go into a landfill or an incinerator. So it's a super powerful leverage point if you can give them new tools. Yep. Yep. I think that's right. I think it was an interesting McKinsey, um, you know, they did the the kind of study in Europe, which I think was probably the most robust data set I've seen around like what it would take to scale and what are the kind of composition of used clothing and things like that. And I think the statistic was like one fifth of clothes today could be fiber to fiber recycled. And when asked the question of like, how are you solving for recycling? Da, 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 I think it's exactly what Caroline and Stacey were just saying. Like we need a hundred percent of it to fit that bucket because that's the only way we're going to solve the end, end, end problem. Because it doesn't matter what we do in those small loops in between. Those are good, but like everything has an end. And so if, you know, it's, it's kind of a two-sided thing, which is if we can get to 80% and we can get recycling scaled, well then, then we just have a collection and distribution kind of yeah. challenge but and that that's a really important point because i think the bridges fashion is a glamorous yeah. industry but there are some bridges that are critically important that are not glamorous <laughs> so like, where have you been for 25 years i'm not so sure it <laughs> is very true very yeah. true but the simple bridge of collection yeah. okay yeah for something to be recycled, someone has got to get it out of your closet and to the yep. right place. Okay, yep. there's nothing glamorous about that, but it's critically important. If that if that doesn't happen, you know, if that doesn't happen, it has no hope of being recycled. And that's also supports some of the great work coming out of four days with the take back program and the take back bag that yep. makes it easy to say, let's let's fix this bridge. Let's get that stuff out of your closet and get it to a responsible place to handle end of life. Yeah. And I think it's that responsible place that's super critical as well, because it's like really nice to say, you know, we just got it out of the closet and dump it at Goodwill or put it in a box on the street. But I think the reality is too, most of those collection efforts have never been engineered to service this kind of principle, you know, like circularity wasn't a thing anybody in the recycling space was talking about mm -hmm. until now. So we're, we're also having to engineer those systems and those processes to really service the end goal, which is to give Stacy the best feedstock possible, ideally post-consumer, <laughs> um, that can cleanly run through her system. But that's, you know, Caroline talks to the bridges. Those are, those are really important to engineer um, through that lens. So, yeah, I really want to go into um, that part about getting it out of the closets and into the brands or to the um, the the service providers that can recycle the clothing, but I really want to talk quickly, or not quickly, but I really want to talk first um, about the challenges in this space and the challenges of textile recycling. Um, you mentioned the sorting and the collecting, but I guess for, again, considering that we have people of all different levels that would be listening to this, um, like, why is that a challenge? We spend a lot of time thinking about the economics of used clothing, and a lot of it comes down to a few things. One is infrastructure and kind of the channels. So where's the clothing going? I'll, you know, historically throwing it in the trash was actually the easiest option. Um, there was no real incentive or even mindset or value shift around why that would be bad. We're, we're working on that culturally, I think across the board. So we're seeing that shift, which is like, Ooh, that feels bad. Then there's, you know, a goodwill and nobody really knew that the majority of that ends up in the trash, because why would you think about that? You think you're giving it to people who need it. Like it's not obvious. And now we know, okay, that's, that's the reality is a lot of that. And the reason a lot of that goes into the trash is just a very inefficient ecosystem and a very inefficient, it's a disconnected, unincentivized ecosystem of sorting, collecting and reselling. And so therefore like the only things that make a lot of money are the things that can be easily resold at the highest price. Mm -hmm. The rest, even in that environment feels like quote unquote trash because it's not a margin driver. And so if you think about the volume of clothes that we throw out, we kind of estimate, we do like rough math on the millions of tons and say, okay, every garment's a half a pound, 50 billion garments a year thrown out in the US. Think of that volume. It is mind boggling. Like we collected 2 million garments last year and we're like high five, nine, you know, it's like we can collect a hundred million next year. We're still like, oh my mm -hmm. gosh, it's so big and so it's massive. massive. 
And so if you think about all those clothes, I call it like chaos theory, right? They go into our cl closets and then it's like chaos and it goes everywhere. It's just distributed. We don't know where it is, what it is, how it's coming back, what its value is. And then we're trying to re-aggregate all of that and not lose money on it. And so mm -hmm. to me, that's actually the most complicated part is doing it efficiently, economically, understanding what it is, identifying where it should go and doing all of that with human capital that's increasingly expensive because at the end of the day, often you have to look at it. How do you judge quality unless yeah. you touch it? And that's the most important definer from a economic value perspective is the highest quality will garner a higher price, which will get you the margin that affords you all the other stuff that you have to take care of. But this, that requires a person and that's really, really increasingly expensive. So just to kind of simplify it in my view, it's like an infrastructure problem um, that's been motivated by profitability incentives that aren't aligned with fiber to fiber recycling. <laughs> One, two, um, it's just really expensive and hard to shift that. And so you have to do it systematically and come through. That's why I was saying like engineering through this lens within reality knowing the economics and knowing that you're not going to be perfect on day one, but if you can start to alter and chip away at it, you can, you can start to change processes. And then, you know, ideally at the end of, end of all of this effort that we're collectively making is that the resulting kind of fiber value increases and then it, it fuels and funds the system in the long run. But so it's, it's just a very complicated, disconnected, disaggregated system at the moment. I was thinking about um, all of the brands, you kind of touched on this earlier, actually, all the brands that talk about having like a recycling program. Um, and I know, you know, we also talked about some of the issues or challenges of recycling is the material makeup. Um, I also know like the zippers and the buttons, like you have to manually remove those, figuring out what's actually in the material when the when the tag is gone and all of that is are all challenges. Um, so I guess I was just wondering when brands say, you know, that they have this recycling program, like what's actually happening to these clothes and then the clothing that can't be recycled, like what's actually happening to it. Um, <laughs> there's yeah. And there's some technology, really interesting technology too. Uh, we've got a scanner that scans the garments and we can pick up the digital signature of different fiber content using a, and a scanner. Um, and when it comes to removing things that are not recyclable, there's a lot of development out there using centrifuge or centrifugal force to remove uh, uh, hardware that's heavier in weight. So it doesn't have to go into uh, a batch to be chemically broken down. But these are all things that people are trying to figure out. You know, it is kind of crazy that shredding metal is actually more effective than having a human pull out a zipper or a, or a, or a burr or something like that. Um, and then of course that metal can be recycled as well. So there are folks that are really trying to solve this problem from a scientific point of view. I don't, you know, brands and retailers right now, I mean, the, the main event uh, that's happening in Europe is uh, uh, waste energy. And waste energy right now is a less bad version of recycling because you take present day responsibility for it versus putting it into a landfill, which is kind of putting the responsibility, you know, 2000 years down the road. Um, and you can use uh you can use things for for energy um, but right now the the goal especially in the united states is we've got a colossal amount of waste we right now it's all entering landfills um, some mun municipalities are actually banning textiles from entering landfills and we do have to make sure that we can you know get these materials out and uh, reprocess them to their highest and best use yeah I think piggybacking on that to answer your question on like what happens for the most part. So like for our products at four days, it's a great example of what Caroline was talking to before we designed for circularity. So every decision we've made on every fiber thread tag label has been, how do we enable fiber to fiber recycling? So that's kind of step one. If you're thinking about this process, those who don't design for circularity certainly are going to have a difficult time claiming like true fiber to fiber recycling. You have to design for it. 
That being said, you also need critical mass in order to process anything through a fiber to fiber process for the most part. So the other thing is, is when people collect one shirt here or 500 shirts there, they're usually sitting in a warehouse somewhere waiting for something to happen. And it takes a very long time to aggregate. So that's another kind of thing just to, you know, to be aware of. I think when, when people are claiming that it sounds really nice <laughs> and we all want to do that. And I, you know, we, we partner actually with brands now and helping enable their, their take back programs, their recycling programs, their fiber to fiber programs. I actually say that up front. They're like, well, we'd love to, to, to recycle our Pima cotton t-shirts. I was like, how many did you make last year? 2000. Okay. Good luck. Like you're going to get 30 of those back, unless you aggregate it into like, it's fine and it's great. We'll collect them, but we have to aggregate it into other materials we're collecting to get the volume, to run it through a fiber to fiber process. And so that's where, um, you know, there's just a nuance to it. So I think when you hear we're doing it, it's like it, a lot of times is a little bit of window dressing. Um, because I think the reality is going back to that, like you need aggregation, you need sophisticated sorting, you need efficient kind of material identification. That's a really, really hard part. Like Stacy's doing it, but if you've ever been to like a typical rag house, they're certainly not doing it. So they have people going, is this cotton? Is this polyester? And you kind of hope you get to an end. Um, and then the re the reality is that still the resale markets are the most economically productive output um, of, you, of, of the used clo clothing, sorting, collecting, and grading. And those aren't, again, all bad. Those are actually good if done very responsibly with precision. Um, but all of that takes additional effort. So I think it's, it's a complicated kind of claim. Um, and we're just in the early phase of it being perfect. When we started four days, we're like, we'll build this perfect system. It'll be great. And we've, we've done that, but we're like, you know, we're a t-shirt company doing it perfectly. And we realize like we have the whole rest of the industry producing like all of this waste, we have to work within, I think Stacy said, the realities of today and how do we start to change it iteratively over time in partnership and meet the brands where they are, meet the customer where they are, stop telling lies. Like, let's tell the truth. This is a complicated problem to solve. Let's do it together. We can activate new behavior, but we have to, we have to kind of chip away at it together. So. And Brittany, I think if you were to ask the brands, what recycling means in their program for every brand making that statement, you would get a different answer, right? Totally. And that's not a negative statement. That's just a statement of the reality of different material types that they're all faced with, right? So if you're a sneaker company, your end solution on recycling is dramatically different from a product like Christie's, a t-shirt company, right? And so, you know, as, as Christy said, many of them are, you know, keeping this material and waiting for the technology to, to catch up in a way. Um, I think we can't be critical of that though, because let's celebrate the baby steps, right? Like we need help with these brands taking the steps to collect. And when the technology does catch up, we'll be able to do something with those materials. So step one, getting it back in the house is, is a good thing. And, and I think that's important to recognize too, that even if the full solution doesn't exist today, don't throw your hands up in the air, take the baby steps that you can and get started on the path. Agree, mm -hmm. agree. I think the diversion from landfill, again, if we just like yep. think about that in your mind, it's just better than landfill. Yep. yep. One thing I was thinking about while you, are, while you all were talking about um, is that, you know, like obviously, textile recycling is in its infancy, right? Like we're still trying to build the infrastructure and all these different pieces of the puzzle. Um, and I guess like, I agree that, you know, we can't just say, oh, it's hard and like not do it. Um, but I'm, I guess I'm curious about your thoughts on promoting and creating like marketing campaigns and all of this around recycling, um, which gives consumers the impression that we're able to do more than we actually are. Um, and I guess I, I wonder, like, is this something that needs to be worked on before it's really publicized and like made into this big to do? I mean, I know we need to get consumers into the mindset of bringing back and taking back and, and um, giving their clothing back to brands and, and uh, manufacturers to be able to recycle. So we do need to start seeding that now. But I guess I'm just curious of like why there's so much attention on it when it's not there yet and it is really confusing to folks um yeah so yeah Brit Brittany this is a great question and I think it goes back to something that 
Christy said earlier around the definition of recycling not being really defined. So recycling to one person may be different to another. So it is really an interesting and it does feel a bit like the darling of the industry right now because we're looking for solutions. This is literally the first step. We've got to get the uh, products back and ideally convert them into their highest and best use. But system-wide, we've got to then take on dyeing, finishing, yarn spinning, knitting, weaving, cut and sew, you know, pattern making, uh, you know, consumer engagement, consumer wear, return reduction, like we, this industry is massive. So where we start is not necessarily where we end. I think starting at the platform is really important because 90% of all clothing is predicated on two fibers, cotton and polyester. That is a massive risk on a platform level. If you've got all of your inventory wrapped up into two fibers, both fibers require tremendous amounts of natural resources. So I would say when it comes to consumer engagement, we do have to do a better job of getting consumers accurate information. We've got to figure out a way to engage with consumers to help them understand what they're buying, why they're buying it, and then inspire them to do something that maybe they don't currently do today, which is to recycle their clothes. So I, I don't have all the answers. I think Christy's working on the actual engagement piece more than we are. We're working on the science side, but you know, it is so challenging when you know brands are trying to sell product and they'll say anything to get product sold. And we're also seeing the backlash of, of some of these claims of what we can claim today versus where we're going in the future. You know, I think everybody on this call is a proponent of being honest of where we're going. And this is the best of what we can do today. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean this is where we end. We're going to continue to innovate and try to fully solve the problem. And then once this problem solved, we're moving up the, we're moving down the road to the next problem. Yeah. I, I, I echo that. I think like better is, is better. And I think that's sometimes hard to define because people want the best because we know that we're at the end to Stacey's point and we're just not close to the best yet, but participating in better means you're, you're activating this as a consumer, as a customer, like you're, you are in this, in the seat of activation because you have the, the, the product at home, you can make different decisions in purchasing it doesn't mean you have to build the processes or not consume or like not participate in all the, the, the nice parts of, of, you know, life in order to participate in the circular economy, but like just getting involved is better than not. And it's a journey, right? This is, yeah. this is absolutely a journey. And part of that journey is awareness. Okay. So, you know, one of the great things that's happened in the last sort of five years is that you know, people think about this, they know about it. It's been brought to their attention. Are they doing it yet? Do they have the solutions? No, we know that that's a problem, but at least they're talking about it, right? If you go back 10 years ago in apparel, it was, it was really not even a conversation, right? Not at any level. Right. So, so we can't act on things that we're not aware of on things that people are not aware of. And I think even the fact that there's, you know, a conversation like this that exists is because people are curious and they want to learn. And a lot of that has to do with what's, bub what's bubbling up from a lot of different areas of communication. What percentage, if you would, if you could say a percentage, do you feel like a product needs to have a recycled material in order to be marketed as recycled and it not be I don't know, like misleading? It's a daily conversation within our organization. I would say 30% would be our minimum of recycled content. Um, you know, and the lower the recycled content, generally the cheaper the product cost is. So again, you've got to meet people where they are. But, you know, what we're trying to do is our technologies, if it's got our brand name on it, it should have a certain level of integrity. And I would say our minimum would be 30% recycled content, but that really goes across the board. And, you know, any recycled content helps technically. We want to get to 100%. In fact, our 100% product that we just finalized is just absolutely gorgeous. 
100% waste, 100% recycled, higher performing than polyester. And it's just, I mean, it's, it's incredible that we could, we've gotten to that point, but I, I really do see it as being a path of 100% recycled, 100% recyclable. It's going to take some time to get there and we're pushing hard, but it's going to take some time. Christy, I wanted to circle back to the consumer. Um, I'm curious, what have you learned about the consumer and encouraging consumer participation from all the work that you're doing at Four Days? I think what's so exciting about where we are, it's kind of piggybacking on this kind of awakening or awareness or curiosity, all of these kind of things that have emerged in consumer behavior and in the consumer landscape are such incredible opportunities to kind of meet people where they are in, in their personal journey. I think what we've learned is that people will activate and participate, just make it really easy. <laughs> and, and that's just kind of universal, right? Like we're just don't do things at a mass scale if they're really hard. And so is there a way to make this participation better for you, more enabling, more rewarding, um, more inspiring, more educational, more engaging. And that's what we, you know, we're, we just constantly strive to do that where we're like tweaking the model, tweaking the kind of system, tweaking the offer, tweaking the incentive, because it's not always the first uh, most obvious thing. Like people will always be like, oh, it's all about incentives, which you just automatically think we'll throw money at people and they'll just do it. No, they won't actually like, <laughs> like that's not enough. Like that's helpful. And it has to be in the equation somewhere, but you have to make these like simple, steps that feel like I can engage and activate and it's, and it's easy and it's meeting me where I am. Like, um, that's what we found very, very compelling. But then we found once you find that little sweet spot, the adoption of that can grow quite quickly and people are really excited to get on board. Um, so that's where, that's where we see the opportunity right now is that like consumers are ready. They're like, tell me what to do. Give me and truth. it's the most powerful leverage point. I mean, if we want to take the world from where we are to yeah. where we're going, we have to get human behavior to shift. So Chrissy, you stay focused on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's our goal play. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to feed you some feedstock. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it, it's the most powerful leverage point in the entire system, because I don't think consumers realize how much power they have. It's their choices that actually keep certain systems in play. I find it really interesting because you always hear, you know, on talks like these or conferences, people talking about the importance of recycling in the circular agenda, um, but still industry buy-in is, is slow. Um, investments in textile recycling are seen as risky because of the amount of capital and I guess the timeline that we talked about earlier of how long this is actually going to take. Um, and it seems like there's this whole kind of like double judge, like waiting to jump in where like brands don't want to come in and then investors don't want to come in because of that. So I guess I'm just curious, we see like there are so many case studies that show that this is possible. It just needs the support to be able to get to the next level. And I guess, um, Caroline, why don't we see more investment flooding into the space to be able to help it to get to that next level? So what's exciting about that question is that I think we are seeing more investment coming into the space and that you know investors and in different types of capital have recognized that this is an enormous opportunity for both impact and returns. And, and this is a good, good, a good thing because we need capital. Capital is the lifeblood of the solutions being able to get from an idea in a lab to a pilot, to a real commercial run and to into consumers' hands. So we, we actually see that shifting. Um, and the apparel industry, remember this is an enormous industry that's touching almost everybody in the on the planet, shifting regulatory environments, shifting consumer sentiment, and I would say also really exciting entrepreneurs that are coming into the space with, with big ambitions to make change. And you know, I think you have two great entrepreneurs on, on the call today that are examples of that. And so we see it as a really strong pillar for investment opportunity and also high impact. And when you're looking at um, innovators, like what are some things that stand out to you as far as um, what you want to invest in? And, and I guess like speaking from an investor standpoint, like what are some things that, that folks look at? Yeah, so 
as I mentioned, this is an industry with, you know, a lot of scale and, and big problems. So we look for solutions that when they get that right, they have the ability to scale it and make it big in terms of impact. And we really, we really need that. This problem will not be solved by niche solutions. So first we're saying, does the solution that this entrepreneur is presenting to us have the potential to, to be big, to have, you know, to have scale behind it? Um, number two, is it market ready, right? Because there are some great solutions that consumers are not ready for in terms of consumer behavior. And so we're looking at ones, again, you want to put into the market the solutions that have adoptability, both from consumers and from brands alike. Um, we look at the adjacencies surrounding those solutions. So what I was talking about before on the glamour side of fashion with the bridges, right? So if you have a great solution, it's living in a complex value chain. Are the adjacencies on either side of it in place to make that work? Or are those gonna be secondary businesses that need to grow before that is a valuable solution? Um, in addition to that, we look at, you know, team is number one, okay? I mean, both Christy and Stacy can tell you what it's like to start an early stage company in this. And these are some tough ladies on this call, okay? Um, <laughs> it takes drive, it takes resilience, it, it takes grit. I mean, this is, these are, these are big problems that they're addressing to solve. So we look at team, do they have the knowledge? Do they have the ability to win the relationships they need in the market? Do they have the drive? Do they have the grit to stick this out over the long run? That is critically important. Do they have the ability to pivot when the market pivots? And these are technologies that don't exist. And so there are discoveries along the way. And I think any entrepreneur who was to this conversation early can tell you, yeah, there are pivots along the way. We learn and we pivot because we're a smart team. And that's really important. And then the last thing I would say is we look at capital intensity because capital intensity over time is a reality of whether a business happens or not, right? So it, will that business be able to get the capital they need when they get to the next step, when they're ready to scale. And, and if that capital is just, you know, absolutely out of scale with, with what the realities of the market are today, then, you know, it's probably better invested behind a different company that has the ability to get there and have the impact that we all need in the sector. I'm curious, Christy and Stacy, what have you learned since starting these businesses about, um, I guess just what's needed in this space um, and and how to build a business that can solve such a large problem. I know this is like a curveball because it wasn't on the, on the sheet, but just hearing that, I'm curious, you know, like what you've learned in the years that you've been doing this. I can start. I actually remember the first conversation I had with Stacey. Again, I think I mentioned this earlier. I feel like we were like the only two people talking in an echo chamber at the time going, wait, this could be a reality. So I think what Caroline said, you know, on the, on the just kind of perseverance front, there's, there's a component of that that's absolutely essential because you're creating something for the first time. And so I think when you're creating something for the first time, there's actually no blueprint and there is no formula and you are going to try and get some things right and get some things wrong. And you have to kind of keep going. Um, that's a really important part. I think staying connected to the other folks doing the same work, even if it might seem competitive or it might seem like we're going after the same partner or we might be going after the same investor. Like I learned so much from my peers and just hearing where they are, what they've seen, what they've succeeded in and not. Um, because at the end of the day, the problem's so huge. It's going to take all of us. Like if you think it's just one person who's going to win, even in like collection sorting and grading again, 50 billion garments, like who's going to do that overnight? We've got a lot. So I think we're all going to have to work together. Um, and that's, that's something that has become just so apparent to me over time. It's, it's perseverance, flexibility, consistent learning, um, and adjustments and collaboration. I think, you know, and those are, those are kind of the, the value set that we try to approach this with. Agreed. I think you're absolutely spot on, Christy. Like this is going to take everybody working at their highest and best use to turn this system around. Um, you know, when we look at other, uh, I, me personally, when I look at other entrepreneurs in this space, I have mad respect for them because I know how hard it is. Even if they are considered a competitor or people uh, perceive 
uh, other businesses is competitive. I absolutely have respect for anybody who's out there forging ahead because we're all a really vital part of this equation. And, you know, the days of, of uh, slamming competitive forces are, are over. That was a very 1990s thing to do, maybe a very 2000s thing to do. But in this current economy, when we're all up, up, up against climate change, uh, we're all against working against uh, the clock here and we all have to support each other. So I think that, you know, the collaborators that are working on innovation and how do we actually redesign the system are incredibly collaborative right now, or at least that's been my experience. And that's when things get really interesting is when you pull all of the things that you're, that people are working on and you stay focused on what makes you come alive and where your core competency is and you trust that someone else has you know another piece but you're one drop in the ocean um in terms of what it's going to take to actually pull this off so it, it is required and in terms of investors man it is not for the faint of heart when i first started this company i got beat up and i was not used to being an entrepreneur i worked at the brand retail level i was an intrapreneur so when I moved to entrepreneuring, it was a huge shock um, going out there and actually working with investors at a time, you know, when I started this business, started the research in 2010, you know, and people weren't talking about textile recycling at all at this time. And, you know, when we were out there talking about what we were going to do, you know, get patted on the head, and say, you know, like, good luck good luck to you. We have no idea what you're talking about. It took some time to really refine how we were speaking. So even the process of raising capital is very challenging. So, you know, we are, we do, I hope that all of the innovators in this space come together and actually put the funding together for the next generation, because those who have walked the path know that, that we've got to reinvest year over year. We've got to increase the pool of capital. And it may not come from the traditional sources. Uh, it may have to come from new sources, but I think that we'll get there eventually. Yeah, and I, I bet one of the things that these two also would say that they have learned in terms of capital is just choose your partners carefully, choose your asset class carefully. I think it's very, it's, it's a heavy part of a business raising capital and it's a big part of the CEO's role. And, you know, there, there are assets outside of money that make somebody the right partner as well. And I think that's really important. Are they mission aligned? Are they timing aligned? Can they add value to your business besides just capital? And the companies that are using those relationships wisely are really benefiting from that. Well, I had so many more questions that I wanted to ask though, <laughs> but we are out of time. Um, I guess to, to send us off, um, I'd love to just learn, well, there's two things that I really want to ask. So I guess you can like pick which one. Um, one, either what's making you excited for the future or roadmap, like steps that, that either a brand or consumers or investors can take to help move this, the needle. I'll go with the exciting part. Because if that's okay, that's like the yeah. more fun one. I'm an internal <laughs> optimist. I think you have to be when you're doing this type of work because you just believe the future is better and different and you kind of see it. You have this like view where you're like, it's going to be there. It's there. We're going to get there. And there are times in the past where I've been like, are we going to get there? And now, <laughs> now I'm, I'm in the zone where it's like, you know, the, the zeitgeist, the externalities, the internal investment that, you know, Caroline was just speaking to the kind of perspective on the importance of this, we're going to get there. And to me, that's the most exciting piece. And, and we have to have patience and all the things that we discussed have to, you know, make advances and we have to make progress and it's not going to be overnight, but we are going to get there. And that's, that to me is, is just really, really exciting. And I think having patience and, and participating in the imperfection along the way is just essential. So, but we're, we're going to get there. <laughs> I, Caroline? I, yeah, I, I love this question. One of the things we get asked a lot by large companies is where do we start? Like, I'm totally overwhelmed. Okay. I, there's so many paths 
a company can choose in terms to how to address recycling, circularity, sustainability conversations. And I think the right consistent message for everyone is just like, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Okay. Just start on your journey. Don't worry what it's going to look like in three years. Okay. Because guess what? In three years, there are going to be new technologies that we're not even talking about today. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes the, the first steps are the hardest and it can be really intimidating. And, you know, it's great that right now we're getting to a moment where consumers and public understand that complex businesses cannot turn on a dime and change everything. So companies should not be afraid to just start where they are and take that first step. Agreed with both sentiments. You know, we are, um, you know, one of the things that we had to overcome really early on, and we still have to overcome it to a certain degree, is the status quo, you know, and the resistance to change. The, the statement that maybe they do, folks do want to change, but it's too difficult, therefore they don't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really, you know, offering solutions that help people build better whatever, if it's a better business, if it's a better product, if it's a better, if it's a better system, better performance in some way, a lot of strong business people know that that's the path to success. And I think that that's where we've got to start is how do we take some of these solutions and actually create better offerings so that we give people a reason to take a chance. Um, you know, for a long time, sustainable materials asked that consumers gave up the way products look, feel, or perform in some way in exchange for the impact reduction. And from a brand retail perspective, you just can't base a business on those kinds of compromises. Um, so it really is about how do we work together to create stronger, more resilient businesses, in my opinion. Amazing. Well, thank you all for taking the time to chat with me and, um, share share insights on this topic um yeah thank you thank you thank you thank us. you so much appreciate it